Hi hey guys. Welcome to our last day of Did I Choose God or Did God Choose Me? Um, obviously, I hope that we've come to the point where we realize that the answer to that question is yes. Um, that God did choose you and yet because He chose you, you chose Him. Um, I hope that's where we're headed. At least I hope that's I hope that's what we're getting out of this. Uh, if uh, Let's just review really quickly what we said. On the first day we said that the Scriptures tell us we're way worse than we thought we were. Um, on the second day, we talked about two things. We talked about how um, who, who God chooses. Um, well, first of all, we talked about how God chooses. That it's unconditional. It's not based on anything inside of you. If you're chosen by God, it's merely out of His grace. I think um, Richie kind of hammered that, home point, that point home last night. And then, um, then we talked about how um, we talked about who God chooses that that Jesus Christ. And again, Richie is stealing all my thunder, but that's okay because he's the main speaker. You know, we like to think of Jesus as passive. He went to the cross. We tend to we're tempted to think of Jesus as passive and think he went to the cross and he was like like a seventh grade girl to dance, just waiting for someone to ask her to dance. You know, just real meek and mild. And he was meek and mild. That's not. Those are bad connotations of those words. Um, you know, and instead, what we really have is we have a fearless hero who is like, barricade, I mean, he is breaking through the barricades of hell and snatching his people and bringing them home. So today I'd like to talk about, um, well, we'll see how this works. Um, I'd like to, uh, oh, am I all the way there? Darn it. All right. Hold on one second. For some reason, it, it flipped all the way to the start of the presentation. I'm having technical difficulties this morning, and I apologize. Um, this morning, yes. I, this morning, I'd like for us... No, don't do that. This morning, what I'd like for us to do is to talk about two things. One, to talk about how powerful is God's salvation. Um, and then two, I'd like for us to talk about um, what, happens, uh, what happens to those who are saved. So, first of all, I want to talk about means and ends for a second. Does predestination make evangelism pointless? This might be a question that you would have if you've been sitting in this class. Okay, if God chooses people, okay, then why do we evangelize? All right? What is the point? Because if God is going to save these people, what is, why do we have to bother with sending out missionaries and you know, co- you know, going and doing um, door-to-door evangelism, reaching out to our neighbors? Why do we have to bother with any of that? God's going to save who He's going to save. Um, well, that's a question of means and ends. Does anyone know what the phrase a means to an end means? Does anyone know what that means? Um, means are how you get somewhere. An end is where you get. Um, the means, that's an old phrase, but what it means is, what it means is the means are uh, the path that you take to arrive at the end, which is the destination you want to, in which you want to arrive. So, um, does... Does this doctrine, which is clearly scriptural, completely negate evangelism? Well, i got two passages for you, just two. We could do a lot more, but um, this is Romans 10, 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on Him who have they, they have not believed? In, on Him whom they have not believed. And are they to believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And then, we've already read this passage once, but in Ephesians 2 it says that Christians are Christ's workmen, that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, actually, what I want to tell you guys is that this doctrine doesn't make evangelism pointless. It makes evangelism possible. All right? It doesn't matter 
Have you ever had a conversation with someone, like a spiritual conversation? It's not like who won the finals last night, but like, like a real like spiritual conversation, and you've just been like, man, I wish my youth minister was here because I just don't know what to say right now. Has anyone ever had that moment? You can raise your hand if you've had that moment before. I've had that moment before. And now I'm a youth minister. Now I'm the person that people are wishing were there. Probably not. But, um, but he, uh, you know, you have that moment where you're like, I just don't know what to say. I, don't, I, did, I didn't say it the right way. I, I didn't. And you get frustrated with yourself. Guys, there's hope for you because of this doctrine. All right? Because what we believe is that we don't save anyone. God saves everyone who is saved. So what it means is that I can lay my head down at night and know that even though my efforts were feeble, that God can use my efforts. If, if this wasn't true, if, if it was up to us to save people, um, if it was up to us to save people, then we could never sleep. You could not justify anything that you're doing. You couldn't even justify being here. All right? Because how could you waste time hiking up a stupid mountain when there are people going to hell and you're not out there making sure they don't? How could you not? But see, the power of the gospel is not you or your presentation. Most of you are probably bad at talking about the gospel. I'm bad at it, so, and I'm paid to do it. So I can imagine that lots of people are, have, have trouble evangelizing. They have trouble sharing their faith. They, it's something that you have to work on, just like anything else in life. If you don't practice it, you will be bad at it the first time you try. Um, but that's okay. It's okay that you're bad at it. I'm not telling you to remain bad at it, but it's okay that you're bad at it because God can use... What's the funny thing about our God and the awesome thing about Him is that His strength is perfected in our awesomeness. No, that's not what that verse says. It says His strength is perfected in our weakness. All right? So when you are out there evangelizing, it's not up to you to get that person to believe in Jesus Christ. All you can do is love them, first of all, share the hope that you have, and then pray that the Spirit would enter their hearts. Because we know that's how people are converted. It's not through argument. It's not through, uh, it's not through some kind of four, you know, the four spiritual laws, as great as they are, that, that does not convert anyone. Um, you, know, the, uh, you know, handing out tracts doesn't convert anyone. Um, you know, doing evangelism explosion, it doesn't convert anyone. Okay, those are great things. And none of those things are, well, maybe handing out tracts is bad, but we'll come back to that. Um, but, there, you know, Gideon Bibles, in the end, even though those are means, those are means to an end, in the end, what converts someone is the Holy Spirit making them alive. I hope that we've learned that so far. That, you know, it doesn't matter. Just think about the funeral home illustration. I don't know if I used that illustration with you guys, did I? I didn't. Um, that if you were in a funeral home and it was on fire, what could you say to the person in the casket? to get them out and save them from the fire. There's nothing you could say. What if you were really good? What if you were Billy Graham or Joel Osteen or someone who's famous for preaching, you know? Um, and I definitely don't put those two in the same category, by the way. But um, the, uh, obviously Osteen's better. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The, um, uh, he preaches health and wealth. It's awful. So uh, anyway, no. Would it matter if you were, what if you were really good? What if you were practice up? Would it matter? No, you could say whatever you want. That person's dead, all right? It doesn't matter. The only way in which they could know the danger they were in is if somehow, by some magical power, they were to be made alive. And that would be a creepy way to wake up in a coffin. But if they were to be made alive, then you could say, hey, look, we're in serious danger. Follow me. Follow me. I know where to go. Then you could. You see, that's evangelism. Evangelism isn't... Um, arguing someone into the faith because there will always be a better arguer. Um, there will always be a better arguer. I've never lost an argument and yet there are still better arguers. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, so, I just want to, I'm sure some of you were thinking that. That's a question I want to handle. Today, the two things I really want to talk about are irresistible grace. In other words, does God make mistakes? Does He miss? If God shoots a sniper rifle, all right, if he aims at people's hearts and hits them and changes them and brings them to life, all right, does he ever miss? All right? Um, and I don't, well, what does the Scripture say? My general answer to that is probably going to be no, just because I have a pretty high opinion of God. Um, you know? But who cares what I think? Again, look at these two uh, passages. These are both from 2 Corinthians. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now I love this passage because this means that you can't judge anyone who's a Christian. You can't judge them based on where they are versus where you are. All right? Because it says that we're being transformed into the same image. Okay, We're all being transformed into Christ's image, but from one degree of glory to another. So that means that like someone who's a huge jerk and gets converted, it might take them a while to become kind. Whereas someone who's naturally kind-hearted, you know, that part might come easier to them. Um, you know, uh, you can use that. You do that with any fruit of the spirit. But what it says is, is that where the Lord now, where the Lord, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that we are, that everyone who is in the Lord is being transformed into the same image. So it doesn't talk about like it's a possibility. It talks about like. It does happen. Now, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What these passages are teaching us, it's it's quite simple as this, is that the medicine always takes. Um, That when God reaches down and grabs someone, no matter who they are, whether they're a prostitute in Jericho whether they're a self-righteous murderer, whether they're a um, you know, national hero, whether they're a, you know, just a minority in Moab. Um, you just look at Jesus' family tree again, referencing, um, referencing Richie's sermon. In every instance, God saves them. And when he goes and gets them, he always gets them. This is where we can find our assurance of salvation. I think Haley asked about that. Um, Like, how can we know that we're saved? We know this, that He who began a good work in you will bring it to full completion. Now, that also means that we're to work out our... You know, we have to remember that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but also what? It is God that works in you both to do and to will. In other words, that when we are saved, if you you have a real experience of God, you can never lose it. That, That God holds on to you and we're kind of leaking into the next point, but that, that when someone is saved or someone is converted or when Jesus has a real interaction with someone, that it always works, that they never say, oh, well, that's awesome, but no thanks. Um, this is how I like to illustrate it. This is the best illustration I can find. It wasn't that great. But um, I want you to imagine that you're walking off a... a that, you're, that you're blindfolded, all right? All right? And let's imagine that you can just look out over this sea of people and everyone is blindfolded and they're all kind of stumbling, bumbling their way. And, and there's a cliff. And at the end of the cliff, there are like spikes and scary stuff and fire and all the stuff that is like pointy and hurdy and um, bad stuff, all right? Now, if, if someone were to run out into that crowd, you know, and to grab one of those people and to pull their blindfold off and be like, look, this is where you're headed. Let's, let's turn around and go this way. How many of those people would be like, no, no, spiky, spiky, hurdy is for me. I'm, I, I'm, no thanks. No, no one would. No one would. Now, what if, um, what if someone was blindfolded and someone, and without the blindfold, we were like, hey, look, you're heading the wrong way, and they were like, look, I think I know what I'm doing. I, I'm, I'm gonna handle it myself. Well, that's a great illustration for how grace works, how the Spirit works. What we are asking God to do when we evangelize. And what we mean by irresistible grace is we are asking the Spirit to give us eyes of faith. All right? We're asking the Spirit to, um, to, uh, to take the scales off our eyes. Like he took the scales off of Paul's eyes. Saul's eyes, excuse me, at that time. Um, he took the scales off his eyes so that he could see again. We're asking God to give that person, if we are ministering to them or we're loving them, what we're praying is that the Holy Spirit would give them eyes so they could see the world for how it really is. They would see that they don't know where they're going. They, they think they might know, but they don't really know where they're going. And where they're headed is a bad way. It's, it's not good. And that we, the only reason that we know the right way is not because we're so smart, you know. The self-righteous ones still have the blindfold on, but they're the confidence ones. Oh, I've got this, guys. I've got it. You know, that's a Pharisee. No, we're not. Someone has opened up our eyes, and so we're desperate to, to show, to have, for them to have the same experience. We can't do it for them. The Spirit must do it. But when the Spirit does it, it always works. All right? It always works. It always takes. That's what irresistible grace means. It means that when God aims to save someone, that he gets them. He gets his man. He gets his girl every time. 
Um, I'm sure you're going to have some questions about that. But um, let me read you uh, John 5, 1 through 5. Again, 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay, what is this passage teaching us? Is it teaching us that if we keep our commandments that God will save us? Absolutely not. What it's teaching us is, is that unless God saves us, there's no way we could keep the commandments. Um, that, we, that we have no hope of ever doing anything righteous unless God saves us. And one of the signs of our assurance, one of the ways in which we can have assurance in our salvation is to see the Spirit work in us and to see us choosing holiness over sin. Do you find yourself, if you're in your Christian walk, coming to points, you don't have to do it perfectly every time, but do you find yourself, can you look back in your life and say, here was a point where I chose to do something simply because it honored God and because I love Him and because He has loved me when it would have been easier or more fashionable to do the other. That is a sign that you are a Christian, all right? That is a great sign that you are a Christian. This is why tithing is awesome, right? No one would give 10% of their money, all right? Tithing doesn't save you. Don't, 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 please don't mishear me. But when someone chooses to tithe, what they're choosing to do is say, here, take 10% or even more of my income. Lord, I'm just, it would be easier for me to just keep it. No one would really know, besides like the church secretary. No one would really know um, if I didn't tithe. You know, so it would be easier for me to keep it. But I'm just going, and it, I, I'm going to be able to do less because I'm tithing. So I'm, it's, I'm, it's going to hurt me in some in some way financially, um, however minuscule or however big, it will affect me financially. But I'm just going to do this to honor you. That is a great sign that someone is following in Christ. Now, you can mishear that and say, oh, well, if someone gives money to the church and they're a Christian, no. What, what I hope you're hearing is this, is that one of the signs that God is working in your life is when you choose Him over yourself. When you choose Him over yourself. You know, the sign that an alcoholic is no longer an alcoholic but a recovering alcoholic is when they try to stop drinking. That doesn't mean they don't fall off the wagon. It does not mean that. They will, and you will, continue to sin. You will still struggle with sin. Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? But, but, if you can look back in your life and see hallmarks of times when the Spirit has convicted you, not condemned you, obviously, but convicted you, of your sin, and you have repented and moved toward Christ simply out of His love towards you, that is a great sign that you're a Christian. If you can't, then that might be a sign that you're not. Okay? Because James tells us that, the, um, that faith without works is dead. And um, it's, it's dead faith. And so if there's no sign, if there's no, if there's no visible sign, it says, we just read a passage that says you're a new creation. Right? And if there's no sign of that, there's not, and you have a reason to question your faith. And I would rather you come away from this questioning your faith than being super sure and really not have it. Do you understand that? Um, okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is um, can you lose your salvation? One of my favorite um, songs is um, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Um, if you've ever seen the, the new version of True Grit, um, it's how the, new, the newer version of True Grit with Jeff Bridges it ends with that song, and that's one of the reasons why I love that movie. Um, but can you lose your salvation? Well, again, what does the Scripture say? So who cares what I say? Um, this is Jesus. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Joe Nevinson uses this illustration all the time. Does anyone here know who Joe Nevinson is? He's a pastor. I know, I know you do, Slim. Um... But Joe Nevison uses this illustration all the time. He says, imagine that this is God and He has grabbed hold of you and this is you and you have grabbed hold of Him in faith. You know, you will get scared and, and let go and try to find something else to hold on to and get all, you know, freaky hand. And, um, but God, He's always got you. Even when you've let go, even when you're scared, he is let, he is all, you're always in His hands. You know, it's not, your, it's, not the, it's not the strength of your faith that saves you, it's the strength of the one your faith is in that saves you. 
Look what First Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I want you to hear this verse because this is very important. That if you are in Christ, you have an inheritance. Does anyone, anyone here have an inheritance? I hope not. They, uh, I mean, everyone does, sort of. You know, when your parents die, they're going to give you something. Hopefully it's not debt. And, um, the, uh, you know, um, we have an inheritance in Christ, and it is imperishable. It will never die. It is undefiled. In other words, it is pure. It cannot be tainted. And it is unfading. It doesn't get smaller over time. You know how things get old over time or die over time. All these things, our salvation is being kept in heaven. And what's protecting it? Is it the three-headed dog from Harry Potter? No, it's not. It's being protected by God's power. All right? God, who is all-powerful, is protecting your salvation. There is literally no way that someone who has placed their faith in Christ can lose their faith. Now, is there a way that someone could say that they placed their faith in Christ and then go away from the faith? Absolutely. Um, again, I-, I hate to quote this verse because this is the verse that like a bunch of pagans use. They're like, anyway. But... Everyone has heard this verse before. Um, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed... It's a great verse, don't get me wrong. Anyway. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I, from which I sent you into exile. And when the Lord moves, it causes His people to move toward Him. Let's see if i got one more verse. I know we're moving really fast, but um, I want to have some time for questions. Um, this, yeah, here you go. I've already quoted this. but uh, this is, um, is this Philippians or Philemon ones? I think it's full. I don't know. Um, PH, that's not even one. Come on. Um, what have I put there? Um, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I'm pretty sure that is Philippians, but um, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Uh, okay. So can someone fall from grace? This is very important for us to understand because let me just tell you a little bit about how I grew up. The, in the tradition where I grew up, like you walked down an aisle and you said that you were a Christian. And then our pastor, the pastor at the time, anyway, he did this really dumb thing. Well, it wasn't dumb, but it was just like it got really trite, where he would be like, um, um, if you receive this believer um, into our community or something like that, uh, signify that with a hearty amen. And everyone would say, amen. And the brother would say, and we love you. And, and everyone would go, and we love you. And then he would go, and we do. And um, I, I heard that probably seven million times. And, um, and, uh, but then you got baptized. That was the thing. Is you, you, you got baptized. So I got baptized when I was... I walked down an aisle and I, um, you know, prayed a prayer and uh, I, I don't want to not be... That was a very legitimate religious experience for me. Um, but a lot of people... And I got baptized when I was like 11 or 12 and when he put me under, my foot came up out of the water and it was really embarrassing. But, um, but uh, yeah. So... This gives you a small picture into everything about my life. And, um, but um, the other thing that happened was that I had a lot of friends, and all of them, at one time or another, walked down an aisle, and they eventually got baptized. But then, and if you asked them, they would say, oh, well, I'm a Christian. Um, they say, oh, I'm a Christian. I walked down an aisle. I got baptized. Um, but there's no fruit of Christ in their lives. They did the same. They were doing this. And the same was true for me. There was nothing going on in my life that, was, that, that, um, that indicated... Um, there were small things maybe, but there, for some of my friends, there was nothing going on in their life that indicated they were Christians. They were doing the exact same things they were doing. They just went to some revival or some youth camp, and they came back and they said they were a Christian. They just kept doing everything they were doing before. It didn't seem like they were a new creation at all. That's why ministry in the South is so hard. I don't know if any of you live in the South, but in the South, everyone thinks that they're a Christian. It's hard to minister in the South and anywhere because everyone thinks they're a Christian. Even the non-Christians think they're Christians. So they're like, oh, well, I walked down an aisle, or I did this, or I did that. Oh, I, I'm a believer. 
And so you're, you're like, well, just hold on one second. Like, do you feel the Spirit working in your life at all? <laughs> um, like, well, I walked down an aisle. Well, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Well, there's a great part of this doctrine. It's really helpful for me, all right? It's this, that there, there are two ways to think about the church. And I'm talking about the church in general, not just your specific church. We have the visible church. And the visible church is everyone who says, everyone who says that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, all right, this is everyone that is a member of a church, all right, and their children. So this is everyone who says that they're a believer is the visible church. And then within the church, we have within that a subset, and this is obviously not the scale, we have the invisible church. And what the invisible church is, is everyone who actually believes in Jesus Christ and is leaning on Him for salvation, all right? Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference between these two things? You can't be in this without being in this, okay? You can't be in this. But you can be in this without being in this, all right? This is a great... There's plenty of illustrations of this in Scripture. The most obvious one would be Judas, right? Now, don't you think about this for a second. When you think about whether going to church will save you, all right? Judas was on a three-year discipleship, like... Jesus is on a three-year RYM with Jesus Christ as the main speaker and the elective leader. Judas was on a three, at least a three-year, maybe more than that, three-year RYM with Jesus Christ as the main speaker. And if you had asked Judas, are you with Jesus, he would have said yes. But was he really with Jesus? No, he was not. You know, the scariest passage of Scripture is that, I think it's in Matthew 7, where Jesus, where Jesus says that on the day of judgment, there'll be people that will say, Lord, we cast out demons in your name, we do this or do that, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. All right? This is why we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. This is why we must do it. It's because there are a lot of people who say, and especially where I'm from, in Mississippi and Alabama, this is a rampant situation is that there are a lot of people who say that they're Christians, but they they're give no evidence in their lives. And I'm not, we're, obviously we don't, you know, we don't ask people to be showy about their faith. You know, Jesus is very clear about that in the, in the um, Sermon on the Mount. At the same time, there's no evidence. There are people who say, I call them license agreement Christians. Have you ever updated your iPhone and there's this long list thing that you can read or you can just click agree at the end? <laughs> yeah. Um, how many people do you know who are just clicking agree like, I just agree with Christianity, but they don't know anything about it and there's no evidence that's affecting their life in some way. Those people are not Christians. Okay? They're not. Alright? They're in the most dangerous position possible. Alright? The best position, the, the, a less dangerous position, I used to do ministry at a really liberal college. Okay? I'm going to not name it since we're recording it, but a very liberal college. And at this college, just no one claimed to be a Christian. Everyone was like, I, don't, I mean, there were a few, we had a few students who did, but people were like, I don't care about religion. Those people are so, those people are so easy to minister, minister to, all right? Because all you have to do is love them, all right? And they know that they're messed up. They know that they're sinners. They understand they're ruined in their lives. They, they've got it. You know who's really hard to minister to? Someone who's a license agreement Christian. Oh, yeah, I agree with all that. Well, do you? Really? Because we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I love this doctrine, you know, because it explains some things that were very confusing to me as a child. Mainly, how do you deal with someone who says they're a Christian, but, there's, you know, you really can't tell in any way that they are? And the answer is that they're not. That when God moves, when God moves, He saves people. And that salvation is sure, and that doesn't mean that you're always going to do... Again, it doesn't mean that you're always... You know, you're going to be a perfectionist from now on and you're never going to sin. But it does mean that the Spirit's going to work in your life. And if you haven't got any evidence that the Spirit's working in your life, you have a really good reason to question whether God is in your life. Um, I'm sure that at the end of all this, um, we've, I mean, we've got ten minutes, so we've got plenty of time. I want to make sure that we had time to talk because I'm sure that I haven't covered some aspect of this really difficult doctrine that... Um, and some of you might actually be wrestling with it. Some of you are just, maybe you chose this because the blurb was funny. Um, but uh, does anyone have any questions about anything, about anything that we've covered this whole time? Haley, go ahead. No, it's fine. I want you to ask. So, 
you know what? I'm going to turn off the mic. So, um, turn off the mic. And